This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Ryan Fabian Crane. We're here today with Eric Larchevec. He's the CEO and co-founder of Ledger. Of course, Ledger, many of your listeners will be uh, aware of because they've been a longtime sponsor of, of the podcast. And actually, Eric, we, I, did, I totally forgotten about it, but he was on the podcast before, which was in uh, 2014, episode 40. So that's like 200 episodes away when Ledger was uh, just getting started four years ago. And, and of course, Epicenter also just getting started. I guess it was about the same time. So yeah, thanks so much for uh, joining us today, Eric. Hello, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very glad to be back four years ago. It's true that it's a lot of time that, I, that has passed and uh, amazing things have happened uh, since uh, this time. Yeah, I mean, Ledger has grown tremendously as a company, right? Back then, it was a little startup. And today, I mean, you, you were mentioning, right? You already moved to new offices, over 100 people there now, and already need to move to the next place because it's not big enough. So uh, yeah, you've had, the, of course, a, a big impact on the industry. But maybe looking back, so tell us, how did you originally become involved in the Bitcoin space? Well, I have been an entrepreneur uh, most of my life. I uh, made my first company in '96. I uh, did so a few startups, and in 2013, five years ago, I saw the price comparison engine, and I was looking for my next, uh, let's say, my, my next adventure, and uh, I stumbled onto uh, Bitcoin. Um, in the beginning, I really didn't understand anything about it, but I was curious. And so I spent uh, time to read about. Um, the white paper, the blockchain technology, the mining, and I got really, I got uh, struck by, by lightning. For me, it was clear that it was the fourth industrial revolution, that it would change everything, and I had to do something in the space. Uh, but I didn't know what to do. It's like doing an internet startup or a mobile app, you know, it's very wide. Uh, and I didn't, knew, I didn't know the ecosystem very, very well at the time. So uh, with my co-founder, uh, Thomas, Thomas France, uh, we, decided, we decided to start by something very uh, horizontal and we opened the physical center in Paris, La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin, with the idea of uh, just being there, doing stuff, having meetup, hackathon, and with the hope that something will happen because there wasn't any business model, it was just uh, taking position on the subject and um, uh, just meeting people and letting the flow uh, go. That's, uh, that's how it started originally. And uh, what happened is that uh, since we were doing these uh, hackathons, meetups, uh, we met a few startups, and there was two startups that we, that we met that was quite interesting. Um, the first one was a beta chip from Nicola Baca, who is now our CTO. He, he and his team were coming from the smart card industry, the security industry, and they were doing this first version of the hardware wallet, which was called HW1, which was at the time extremely technical, very, very difficult to, to use, no documentation, no user interface, uh, but uh, very interesting because it was really starting to solve the, 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 the problem, the issue of endpoint security. And there was another startup from Joel Pobeda, uh, who is now our uh, co-founder, and he was selling uh, Bitcoin through postal services, through UPS, uh, to solve the KYC and make sure that uh, there couldn't be any fraud with the credit card when you were paying. And he needed a media, he needed something to send the private keys, and he didn't want to use a USB stick because it wasn't secure. And so they started to work uh, together, uh, and they did the first implementation of a hardware wallet that you could use. Uh, and it was really, um, really the beginning, and I, I saw them working together. We did a hackathon. Uh, and then we saw that we 
not only we were all working well together, but we share the same ID, the same vision that blockchain technology, cryptocurrency couldn't scale without endpoint security. And so we decided to merge the three startups, the three teams, and this is how Ledger was born end of 2014. Yeah, I mean, I remember those early days uh, in Paris. Um, I mean, I wasn't living in Paris at the time, but I mean, I, I, this is exactly the same time that I was getting involved with blockchain and you know, starting Epicenter with Brian. And uh, I remember those early days of coming coming at Les Maison du Bitcoin. And uh, it, it was sort of like the, the hub in France of like where everybody would just sort of uh, come together. You know, there were meetups there. You know, there were a couple of companies sort of starting there. Um, and in, in, in sort of my, um, you know, also getting into this space, it was, it was very pivotal in, in, in that time. Um, so it, it, it's, and it's still, it's still there today, although Ledger has moved out from there, obviously. Uh, um, so what, what role does Lemons on Bitcoin play now in, in sort of the broader Ledger strategy? So when we created Ledger, we created a new business model and new line of products, which was not really related to a Bitcoin space or a Bitcoin broker. And what happened is that we, uh, uh, La Maison du Bitcoin is now um, a spin-off of, uh, of Ledger. So it's not the same company. It's a different company uh, with some of the shareholders that are shared with uh, Ledger, but they are really distinct. And so La Maison du Bitcoin, which has been rebranded CoinHouse because it's more international, uh, is now living its, its own life. There is uh, a team, a CEO, uh, and uh, their strategy is completely um, decorrelated from, from Ledger. Uh, so really, we, uh, we branched out uh, because it was too complex to have two uh, completely different business models in one. And, um, and so now uh, Ledger is living its life and uh, CoinHouse uh, is living its, uh, its life on its own. But there's still a, there's still a physical uh, exchange counter there. There are events uh, and like regular meetups and sort of regular uh, educational events there happening? Yes, uh, Maison du Bitcoin, CoinHouse, it's uh, continued to fulfilling its mission of, uh, of education, of getting an easy access to cryptocurrencies. Uh, so now they are uh, 27 uh, working uh, there and also working on the website, on CoinHouse. And they are still doing events, still doing uh, some meetups uh, and also doing a lot of education on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies in general. So they are really continuing their mission in the same way that, than, what, that, than that what we started uh, almost four years ago. One of the things I'm curious about, so you started Ledger back then, right, which was a hardware wallet. And I, I can remember maybe that this, a lot of people had this conception that, you know, hardware is hard to scale and, you know, it's, it's hard to make a profitable business out of it. And, you know, doing kind of software-based businesses, you have much more uh, potential. Did you also have concerns like that when you started Ledger? Or how did you think about the choice of, you know, doing a ledger and these hardware wallets versus, I don't know, maybe other ideas that you considered back then? Well, um, we really understood quickly that all the identity system, all the security of uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies was based on the, the security of private keys. That basically it was a bearer bond and you had to secure it. Um, and the only way to secure it uh, is... Uh, through secure hardware. And so it was clear for us that it was needed to have this hardware wallet, that there wasn't any good alternative. Um, and that's also true because uh, we had this vision because uh, from a long time in France, we have this uh, chip and pin credit cards. We use uh, this smart card technology for decades. So it's a little bit in our culture to understand the importance of secure hardware. But from the point of view of early customers or even investors at the time, no one really uh, thought that it would work because you were, we are speaking about the cloud, about so-called vir virtual currencies. And so uh, everyone was saying, why do you need a hardware? Why do you need a piece of hardware when everything now is uh, completely uh, dematerialized? Everything is in the cloud. Uh, so we had a hard time at the beginning to, uh, to convince uh, consumers and, and investors. 
uh, because it's hardware, so hardware is also not very popular. Uh, it, it's hard to scale, uh, and it, it, it wasn't at all fashionable. So I would say that for the first years of Ledger, it was quite difficult. We didn't uh, encounter the success uh, immediately. We spent two to three years to do a lot of education regarding the importance of, uh, of hardware. And, and during that time period, I mean, I, so I, I sort of, you know, based in Paris and, and, and you, knowing you personally, you know, sort of followed the, the, the evolution of Ledger and saw Ledger go through different phases. Can you talk about some of the, I mean, obviously now you're, so you're on, on a good track now to become success in this space. Can you talk about some of the things that you learned along the way, perhaps some failures that you can point to uh, where you thought, you know, okay, we're going in this direction, but in, in the end turned out to be not the, the, the the, the good strategy or the good direction to take? Well, the key learnings are about resilience. It's about uh, not dropping the ball, not dropping the project, uh, even though everyone is telling you that it's not going to work, that everyone is not is telling you that hardware is not good, that Bitcoin is dead. Uh, we had a very hard time in 2016. Um, it was you know, the time where uh, we had this blockchain good, Bitcoin bad. Uh, and to survive, we, we had to do like everyone. You know, we had to pitch uh, blockchain. Uh, we had to pitch about how oh, insurances, company, banks are going to uh, to change the way they work using the blockchain technology. So it, it was a lot of of bullshit. And uh, but it was the only way for us to survive. And um, it, it was a hard a hard year because. We, we had to stop speaking about hardware. We had to stop speaking about security. We had to speak about uh, blockchain. And we all knew that it didn't make a lot of sense, but that was the only way to capture the imagination of investors and potential customers. We were still selling, of course, our hardware wallets, uh, but the revenues were quite, uh, well, not really material. Uh, and so uh, we had to... Um, we did the first uh, seed round in uh, early 2015, uh, but soon we had again to raise some money and we did a Series A. And this is at this time that we had to pitch our uh, investors and we had to pitch uh, the blockchain story. Uh, and uh, what happened is uh, we found some investors who were quite interested about uh, the blockchain uh, technology uh, and not so much about cryptocurrencies. And at the time, it looked like it was the only way uh, forward. So we had to adapt a little bit our strategy to close the round. Uh, and what happened is that a few months after we closed our Series A round, it was in early 2017, uh, the world of cryptocurrency started to scale. It was everything about ICO, Bitcoin was growing. Um, and so our lead investor uh, was a big insurance, big French uh, insurance legacy, uh, got quite scared, uh, scared because uh, they, they thought that they invested into a blockchain company and uh, the business of crypto and hardware wallets and ICO and everything started to scale. Uh, so they, they really got scared and exited the company uh, very quickly. Uh, so it's just a story about, uh, it's about the importance of resilience. And when we did our Series B, uh, one year after, uh, the deck was exactly the same than the seed. And it was uh, striking uh, because our Series A deck was a little bit, you know, bullshitty blockchain. And because we didn't have any other choice, we had to mask our real IDs. Uh, but the Series B and the seed was identical. So it's, it's good to see that at the end, we didn't pivot at all. We adapted, of course, our products and technology, but the vision was exactly on spot on from the beginning. And at some time, we almost went out of it because we didn't. We felt that we didn't have any choice. But luckily, we were able to, to, to come back on that and now scaling, uh, really focusing on endpoint hardware uh, security. Wow, that's fascinating. Super interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember that time well, right? And I, I think... <laughs> You know, I was also working sort of in an enterprise blockchain thing and say, well, here also is right. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think we, we all had uh, we all had some time in, in that. But what's uh, what's striking, just to point out, what's striking is that it, it, going back, I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but going back, I, I, I think that in my mind for a while, 
I actually did think that this was the way that things were going to go, right? That like enterprise adoption was going to be like how blockchain would come to mass adoption. When, uh, but but yeah, we have to we have to like keep keep our focus on the true vision. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. This was the same with me. I mean, I, I did. I just felt like the first there would be this enterprise adoption, and and that was more where you could get to like revenues and business models, and and then later that it would more like branch out and. Into, into consumer use cases. But with you, Eric, it seems like you, you always felt actually with cryptocurrencies and, and the more of a consumer-focused thing was where it was most interesting. So you, 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 never, you never were like sold on the kind of blockchain story. Is that right? Well, um we we always we are true believers at Ledger of uh, the decentralization of cryptocurrencies of of Bitcoin and uh, what we can call the, the vision of Satoshi Nakamoto, even if it's hard to see exactly what was his uh, end game. Uh, and it's true that enterprise blockchain was not really something that we we, we really liked because. Uh, it didn't feel like uh, it, make a, it made a lot of sense. Um, however, uh, we always saw that enterprises or, um, or banks or financial institutions were, was part of the equation. Uh, and today, we are having products that are catering for enterprises, but in a different way. It's more about helping these enterprises, these financial institutions, to go into cryptocurrencies and it's less about uh, enterprise blockchain, but ultimately uh, we think that there are going to be some use cases and valid use cases where we are going to see this uh, consortium blockchain or things which are going to have a real help on some business model. But it may take a while to go to uh, it may take a while to go to market. Yeah, I, I agree. There's, there's a lot of pieces that need to come into play there before that starts to happen, and, and it, it, I think it's quite likely that. When that does happen, there will be a lot of uh, uh, components of that infrastructure that will be uh, more on the decentralized side that will be facilitating or helping or somehow taking part in building other ecosystems that are more permissioned or consortium based. Um, so let, let's come back to this this period of 2017, end of 2017, early 2018. Uh, the, the price of cryptocurrencies uh, reaches new all-time highs. You know, Bitcoin reaches almost $20,000. And... All of a sudden, you're faced with uh, this influx of new customers. Um, can you talk about that period and what was it like uh, within Ledger to go from selling maybe a, a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand units a month to, you know, that order of magnitude on a daily level, on a daily basis? Yeah, it has been a, a crazy and amazing year. Uh, that was. That surprised us a lot because, of course, we are we are always a believer of, of crypto and our technology and everything. But I would never have thought that it would have gone that fast. And in 2017, we were forecasting to sell about maybe 60,000 nano S, you know, 60,000 units of our uh, hardware wallets. And ultimately, we sold about 1 million units. So it's, uh, it's an order of magnitude uh, difference. And it has been uh, mayhem. I mean, uh, we had to scale the company in months, in weeks. We had to hire a lot of people. Uh, we had to change the way we were working. Uh, and also, it's not just about software. It's not about, you know, piling uh, servers and racking new servers. It's also about uh, industrial production. It's about shipping. It's about people uh, putting stuff into boxes and then shipping them. And it's about also supply chain. It's about uh, being able to source all the chips and everything. So it, it was very hard to scale. And that's why we had a lot of uh, weeks and months where we were completely out of stock, uh, where basically the Nano S, the, this device, uh, the, the price of, because it was rare and it was very demanded, uh, you could find some Nano S at five hundred dollars on 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 eBay or even on Amazon. Uh, the normal price is about hundred dollars. Uh, so it, it was really crazy. Um, 
and everything had to scale. The customer support, our infrastructure, we were all the time having a, a lot of problem because it was impossible to scale as fast as the market was. Uh, but it was an amazing, it was like six months of, of craziness where, you know, you are energized uh, like, uh, like crazy because when you, you know, they say uh, you, build, you, you build it and they will come. You know, this is all <laughs> something what we say about products. But yeah, they did come uh, and they did come in masses in a way that we could never have predicted. And so I think it was maybe uh, so far the best six months of my entrepreneur uh, life because when, when you build a product that becomes some kind of worldwide phenomenon that everyone is trying to buy, we, we had to shut down our phone lines. We had to remove our address from the website. We had to really to, to hide because people were taking planes. I remember there is uh, one trainee from a hedge fund in New York. Their boss told him to take the plane to go to Paris, to go to our office and to buy a box of 100 nanos, you know. So the guy had to do take and go. Uh, and, and we didn't have the, the stock because we were completely sold out. So the poor guy did all this trip for nothing. And we had a lot of people like that trying to enter, to call, to, 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 to source uh, our devices because there was so much in demand that it was also an easy profit. Uh, we had tutorial on, on the Russian website about how you can buy from our website and resell at double or triple the prices so to make money. It was completely crazy at this time. Uh, now the situation is different, of course, because uh, the market has slowed down and now we have stock and uh, we are in completely in position to, 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 to fulfill the, the, the market demand. But at some point in February, in December, I couldn't believe my eyes when I was seeing the level of orders. It was it was madness, but uh, it was a very it was a very good time uh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. Like as as a as any sort of Bitcoin blockchain or uh, people are coming to you at this time saying like, how do I secure my crypto? Like, I remember at this time, like quite a few people were asking me. Saying, "Oh, you know Eric, you know Ledger, you know, can you just go to their office and try to get some extra units?" Like, no, there's no units. There's nothing. Everybody's sold out. And uh, actually, I was in I was in Asia recently, and I walked into someone's office, and they had a stack of about I don't know, 25 or 30 ledgers just there on a shelf. I think they maybe had bought them prior and never ended up selling them, but they're they're holding them for a rainy day. If ever you need extra ledger stock, some guy in Asia has a bunch on his office. Yeah, that that's fascinating. And so, what what are the do you, have, do you have any other interesting anecdotes about about sort of some crazy things that happened during that period? Well, we um, we had to scale, we had to to hire, uh, because basically when when the craziness started, we were about uh, I guess uh, twenty or twenty two. Now we are one hundred and forty in the company, uh, and what is incredible is that we we added more than hundred person. And in fact, we are more or less serving the same amount of customers than we were before. It's just to say that we we were so much in, in, in uh, stretching uh, that uh, we were able. To, uh, it's a miracle that we didn't explode it, you know, uh, because when you have too much traction, uh, you can just uh, die as a company because you, you take the orders and you cannot fulfill and then you, you lose the confidence of your customers and then you spiral down. Um, and, and so it was very intense. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons that we, we were able to, to survive is because we we onboarded uh, Pascal Gauthier, which is uh, from from one of the co-founders of Criteo, which has already seen how to scale a company from uh, 20 to uh, 1,000 person and IPO a company. Uh, and he was an early investor, a business angel, but I remember we went into consensus uh, of 2017. So it was in May, I think, of 2017, like one year ago. Uh, and he was here because uh, he was an, an investor. He was also interested into Bitcoin. And we told him, okay, let's come with us. You know, you are going to see. Because it was already starting, you know, to, 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 to sell more and more. And um, we, I think this is this day that we understood that everything changed. Uh, because we had like... I think 100 nano S that we put to the conference because we always they, we always come with devices and we sell them. Uh, but usually, you know, we sell them a few. It's not like crazy. 
And there was a lot of people at the booth like waiting, do you have Nano S, do you have Nano S? And I, I said, okay, we are going to start to sell them at 10 a.m. Uh, and, and then there was a lot of people when we started to sell. And the first guy asked ask me, okay, how, much, how many do you have? I say, okay, I think we have 100 units. And the guy said, okay, I take them all. Uh, <laughs> and this is uh, where Pascal saw also that something changed. And uh, we agreed that he would come as president and help us scale the company. And he has been uh, instrumental into uh, uh, helping us to, to, to build all the support function of, of Ledger. And, and today at Ledger, for instance, there are 10 lawyers, 10 in-house lawyers, just to check everything about... You know, certification, import, export, taxes, corporate, uh, risk, security, everything. It's just to say that the level of support function that you need uh, for a consumer company who is selling in 165 countries is, is tremendous. Uh, so that's also why uh, we decided to do a big uh, Series B round uh, because uh, the, the level of investment that you need uh, if you want to scale a company uh, is, is, is very big. Uh, and we have uh, like large, very large ambitions for Ledger because the hardware wallet is just one side of our business. It's just one pillar. Uh, and we have others to build. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of energy. And now we are really focusing on, on execution to, 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 to have this vision uh, moving forward. So you, you talked about this crazy growth going from 20 people to 140 people now. How did you do that? Like, how did you hire so many people? Like, what did you look for in people? And like, what, what went well about that? And what were some of the struggles with growing so quickly? Well, the struggle is that you not only you need to execute and do your day-to-day -day job and solve all the issues and, 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 and just cope with everything which is happening, but also you need to hire. So it needs, you need to spend a lot of time in interviews because one thing which is very important is culture. Uh, because when you need to hire 100 person, uh, uh, you cannot make mistakes. Uh, because if you do mistakes and if you hire anybody on the spot like that because they just feel okay, then you can destroy the company from, from within. It's not that people are not good or are, they won't do the job properly, but if they don't share the same culture, if they are not a fit for the company, it can completely uh, sure. destroy you. So. It was important to spend some time with the candidate, with every candidate that we were hiring, just to make sure that they had a good fit. And at Ledger, we are looking for people who are very autonomous, who are okay to take charge of uh, of their different tasks, because we don't we don't micromanage. Um, the trust is given; it's not uh, won. So it means that when someone arrives. Okay, we give them all uh, all the trust that they need, and we let them do their 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 things. Uh, so they need to also to work well into this environment. There is a lot of um, you know uh, matrix management in the sense that uh, uh, a lot of the support functions are uh, horizontal in the company, so they need to to work well with a lot of different people, um, and they also need to have this kind of fire and passion about uh, about the project, about the vision, um, because it's quite demanding uh, to work at Ledger, especially in an environment where you have so much uh, growth. And each time that we have some people arrive, immediately it was completely uh, overrun by things. Uh, and so you need to have people with a lot of energy, a lot of uh, goodwill. Uh, and, and that was one of the important aspects of the recruitment to find people with internal fire and, and energy. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is.
So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. So we talked a little bit about the funding round. Uh, one point that I wanted to bring up is just, um, so the Series B that you closed, uh, I believe it was earlier this year in 2018? Yeah, it was in January uh, 2018, and we closed uh, $75 million. Right, so $75 million US round. Um, and so you, you raised this money uh, right when... Um, well, I guess you were doing the fundraising when when cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and everything was sort of ramping up to this to this uh, this uh, pivotal point at the end of 2017. Talk about some of the challenges uh, about raising that much money in this nascent industry, and also particularly in France. Uh, and and given the types of investors that you have, that are institutional investors uh, like like uh, Cate, what are some of the challenges there? Yeah, we decided to raise uh, to raise money, uh, to raise a big round quite in, in the summer of uh, 2017. We decided that we needed to raise a, a large round. So why? Uh, so the company is is profitable, uh, and uh, when we we did a, a lot of sales, we could think that why not trying to. Uh, just to grow organically and not uh, have a dilution. Um, but there were two things that we were looking for. The first, of course, was money, uh, because it's important to have a war chest. A uh, lot of, of other players were also raising large rounds. And when you are in hardware, uh, when you are in security research and development, uh, you need a lot of cash, uh, because uh, cash is, is fuel, cash is life, and you don't know when the market is, is going down. And uh, because we were sure that at some point uh, the craziness will, will cool down. I mean, it's, it's only logical. We couldn't know when or how, uh, but it was important for us to have this war chest to make sure that even if we had some kind of nuclear winter, we wouldn't have to change our uh, to, to change the strategy of the company. And and the second uh, the second reason. Because, about raising money uh, is that we wanted to have partners, partners to help us to uh, for the internationalization of the company, uh, to help us on Asia, to help us on the US, uh, because we have customers everywhere. We sell in 165 countries, and we wanted partners we can rely on, and not just money. And that's why also we didn't do an ICO. Uh, because everyone was ask us, asking us, why why are not you doing an ICO? Well, first of all, uh, utility token wouldn't make, uh, I guess, any sense for Ledger. But more than that, it was not just about money, it's about finding the right partners. And so we ended raising with uh, Draper Esprit, uh, Team Draper, uh, Cathay Capital, uh, which has a lot of you on China, uh, Corelia, which is also about South Korea, First Mark in the US, which is a tier one fund, you can help us also structure in New York, uh, and, and, and a few others. Uh, and so it was instrumental to, to, to help us to get all the right vision and the cash amount to deploy our vision. Uh, because as I said, it's not just about consumer electronics and hardware wallet, it's also about enterprise solutions for financial institutions, the vault, which is uh, enterprise key management. And it's also about everything that we can call IoT, machine-to-machine -machine transactions and payments, where we can see a very big futures. And on that, we need to invest a lot. For instance, we are investing $10 million into a facility in France uh, for the production, for the shipping, because right now we are doing a lot of production in China, but one of our objectives is to relocate the production in France because we believe it's, uh, if it's important uh, for not just about the quality, because you can have good quality in China, uh, but we can have a lot of flexibility by producing uh, locally. And also it's part of the mission of Ledger uh, to be uh, socially responsible. Uh, and it's always better to, to create uh, work uh, into, uh, into France, into our regions, especially that we are in the center of France where there are not that many jobs. Uh, so it's also in line with the stories and what we are trying to do at Ledger, uh, but also is going to help us have, uh, let's say, a more efficient uh, management and production line for, uh, for the future. So we're also investing a lot into security. We are building a security lab to make sure that uh, everything is uh, working well 
and that we have uh, uh, like uh, six to eight security experts attacking all the time uh, our firmware, our devices, uh, to make sure that everything is really uh, shut and uh, tightly shut regarding security. Well, we need to hire a lot of workforce internationally. We are in San Francisco, we have opened New York, we are opening Hong Kong. Uh, so we need to be present on the ground uh, and we need to, to build a Salesforce task force, our SaaS product for enterprise. We need to hire also for IoT. So it costs a lot of money, it's a lot of investments. And that's why, despite the fact that the company is profitable, uh, we need to move forward quickly because it's about execution. It's about uh, taking the global market uh, as fast as possible because our ultimate ambition is really to, to build a very large uh, technological company which is going to provide with all solutions for security and infrastructure for cryptocurrency and blockchain applications. Quirk, thanks so much. I re uh, it's really fascinating to hear you know, just how Ledger grew in, in this process. So I'm um, really glad you're sharing this. So I'd I'd love to I would love to speak a bit about sort of the aspect of building products you know in the blockchain space and the unique challenges around that. So you you built a bunch of companies before. What do you think? Are there some you know big fundamental differences in blockchain, or what are some unique challenges in building you know cryptocurrency products? Well, I would say that one of the specific aspects of all these. Um, cryptocurrency space is the fact that there are strong communities uh, and it's sometimes um, not, always, not always easy to, uh, to manage these communities and, and, and the people because they can have strong opinions. Uh, and uh, to just take an example, it's like Bitcoin versus Bitcoin Cash. We are a technology provider. Uh, we, it's not our point to take sides, you know, it's uh, because we secure endpoint and uh, we are not here to say that this is bad or this is better uh, because that's not uh, the mission of Ledger. Uh, but sometimes when you try to do things or if you are not delivering the latest update about this crypto or this version of the crypto, you know, people start to really uh, become crazy and, and think that uh, we are trying to sabotage and there are all these uh, ideas that uh, we are we want this or we want that and uh, uh, it's uh, it's um, sometimes it's uh, it takes a lot of energy uh, the, the the other aspect is that uh, in cryptocurrency it's everything you are your own bank you have a lot of uh, responsibilities uh, so you have to be cautious about what you do and it's very hard to close the gap between uh, let's say uh, people who do not understand what they are doing because a lot of people recently have invested in cryptocurrency without understanding what they what what it is but they still want to secure it and security uh, so you need to explain um, to people who do not understand IT uh, that if they do something stupid, they can lose everything that they have. It's like, you know, sometimes when I, when I talk to customers, it's like they, they, they take cash, you know, real cash, they put a gasoline on it, they light it, and, it's, and they say, why is it burning? Why is it burning? You know, and, and it's very hard to, uh, to find the right way to, to explain to people how they can secure their assets because it's part of our mission uh, to basically uh, bring something easy and simple to uh, to users but that's the biggest challenge uh, and because what we try is to remove anxiety from our customers because when they are not secure they feel bad at night you know they have nightmares and uh, and and the idea is when they buy uh, ledger devices they have to feel much more calm and they have to feel good uh, and so we need to provide with the best experience possible and we know that uh, we have a lot of work to do on that. And uh, one of the next milestones is to provide with a new version of our wallet software, which is going to go uh, live on uh, July 9th. And we hope that it's going to, to also to help uh, new uh, users and newbies uh, to, to, to go into the, the, the cryptocurrency space uh, securely and with a lot of... Uh, with much more easiness, uh, because we know that with SegWit and the forks and everything that we have now, sometimes people don't understand anything, and that's quite that's quite challenging for for everyone. 
Yeah, well, let's speak about that application exactly. So I'm, I'm very excited about this, right? Because Ledger so far has used basically Chrome apps. So Chrome apps are, well, Sebastian would know better, but yeah, you basically can get this through the Chrome App Store and then you had these different applications, right? So there was a Bitcoin application, an Ethereum application, you know, a Ripple application, a bunch of different currency. And then there was also a Ledger manager. So you had all of these separate applications. And it's interesting because I feel like in the beginning, you know, the Ledger user experience was really good. And then over time, it kind of like got more and more as I think the complexity grew so much. And you guys had to handle all of these different forks, these different things. It, it you know it became harder to accommodate that I think in the initial initial kind of setup and and you know an example would be that okay you can only have a limited amount of applications and now now it asks okay okay can you update the applications but there's not enough space so they have to so a lot of there's a lot of these like challenges have grown up and now there's this this new application that you talked about which which is you know desktop and mobile application and the screenshot it looks fantastic right to have like one unified application. So how is that, how is that new application going to work? Can you share a bit more about that? Yeah, of course. So you are totally right. The Chrome apps, which were at the beginning quite uh, well received, became more and more uh, complex because we had to to hack it and had all these forks and segwit and everything, and it became uh, not easy to use. And then there was after the Ethereum app, the Ripple app, and uh, the manager. So people started to to to, to get lost uh, into all that. So the, the new application is going to be uh, a single app for everything. We are going to release in steps. We are not going to have all the feature uh, on the first version of the app, which is going on the July 9th. Uh, but basically, you will have the possibility to have all your accounts uh, in one app. So you can scan all your different uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, uh, Ripple, etc. App, app uh, accounts. Is going to add them into the, the the application, the desktop app, and you will have all your portfolio uh, and easy to click. Uh, let's say send, receive with added security features to make sure that uh, you can verify your address. We have also an onboarding procedure which is going to make sure that everything is all right. Uh, we ask a lot of security questions. Uh, there is the manager, which is integrated, uh, so you can add and remove application quite easily. Um, and in, in, the, in the next release of the application, we are going to see uh, like easy auto-install of, uh, of apps. Like uh, you want to, to manage different, uh, different uh, cryptos, it's going to remove the apps, install the apps, Automatically, you will not have to think about uh, all that to do that on your on your device. Uh, you will have auto scan functionality. Uh, it, it will be much better, and ultimately, you will be able to follow all your crypto in only one uh, application. Um, so not only it will be uh, useful as a wallet, uh, but it also can be useful as some kind of portfolio uh, manager. Uh, and right now we're going, we are going to publish the desktop app. So on, it will work on Windows, on Mac, on, on Linux. Uh, and we are going then to follow up a few months after with the mobile app. Uh, which uh, will give you see the possibility to uh, see your accounts and, and spend from uh, from your Android or uh, iOS uh, application. So it's going to be, uh, I think, uh, a very well uh, deserved, uh, let's say, improvement of user experience for our customers. We know that we took a lot of time to release it uh, because it's this application is on our roadmap for a while. Uh, but all this, the, the crazy scalability, the crazy growth that we had to, to, to go through uh, last year completely uh, changed uh, all our initial plans and we had to work in priority into scaling on our infrastructure. And then only we had the time to work on the new versions of our uh, application. That's, uh, that's really good news. I can't wait to, to try the new application, uh, the new wallet and... and uh see how, how that experience is, is being in, improved by this unified desktop application. I think, I think a lot of people are going to like it. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the product. So we've, we've talked a lot about the company, but um, let's talk about your product lineup. So I believe right now, uh, looking at the website, uh, there are sort of three main products. So the Ledger Nano S, 
the Ledger Blue and the Vault product, which uh, is something that's quite new to me. Um, could you talk about these different products of broadly uh, what, what they do and who they're for? So the, the Nano S is our bestseller hardware wallet. So basically it's a digital safe uh, to manage securely cryptocurrencies. So it caters for any individuals who own cryptos and wants to secure them. Um, so it's really a consumer-facing uh, uh, product. It can be used by professionals, but basically it's for individuals, in the sense that you have one person, one, one device. Uh, the blue is uh, like a Nano S, with, but with um, let's say an improved user experience with a touch screen. So it's, uh, it's easier to use for people who liked big screens. Um, but we are going to sell a, large, a last batch of, of the blue, and then we are going to retire it from uh, the consumer market and use it only for our Vault product. And I'm going to, to, to explain what it is uh, because it's the, 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 the blue is really a premium product and it's very hard to scale. And we, we, we couldn't uh, really uh, improve all the, the production without raising the price uh, too much and it wouldn't make sense for a consumer product. So it's going to get, uh, we are going to continue to support it, but it will not be possible to, to buy it uh, anymore after the, the last batch. Um, and the Vault, so the Vault is an enterprise product. It's, uh, it, it makes sense uh, when you have, let's say, a minimum of $15 million of crypto to, uh, to, uh, to secure because it's, it's an expensive uh, solution. It's an enterprise key management SaaS uh, product. Uh, which basically solves the need for professionals to manage large amount with governance. Uh, because let's say that you are a hedge fund and you have $100 million to secure in Bitcoin, you could use a Nano S, a key, uh, but then the question is to whom do you give the device? Is it the CEO, the CFO? Where do you store it? What happens if the CFO uh, becomes crazy and runs with the money? What happens if people with guns go into your office and ask you for the device? Uh, I mean, you can have cyber security protection, but you, you do not have any protection against this kind of uh, physical risk and threats, which are quite big when you start to have a large amount. Uh, so the idea of the vault is to provide with governance, which is multi-signature, multi-authorization, uh, time locks, uh, delayed opening, uh, rate limiters, etc. All the features which are required by professionals. And it's a SaaS solution in the sense that uh, we manage everything for uh, the customer. The customer keeps the ownership of the keys. So it's not a full custodian solution. This is for self-custody. Ledger is never the owner of the private keys. We provide with all the infrastructure so, it, so the private keys can be managed securely using multi-signatures, and it works for any kind of cryptocurrency, even if they don't have the blockchain-based multi-signature, because we do a multi-signature which is enforced by hardware. So on the server side, we use what we call hardware security modules, HSMs, which basically are very secure servers, some kind of very large hardware wallets. Uh, and on the endpoints, each of the operators of the vault, which can have as many accounts as they wish, have a ledger blue, which is used as an authenticator to either request a payment, request a transaction, or to approve a transactions. And then transactions are ultimately approved by the HSM, by the server, when they have the quorum of the signature at the endpoint, or if enough time has come by because you can have this delayed opening. And so our customers are uh, hedge funds, family offices, investment banks. We have in Europe, in the US, in, uh, in Asia. Uh, the, the pricing is based on the assets under management. It's basically 48 base points per year. And it is an enabler for all these enterprise, uh, all these financial institutions to come into the cryptocurrency world because without security, without the proper key management, it's not possible for them to scale because uh, investors or uh, LPs, limited partners, are not going to put more money if the fund, the hedge fund, cannot provide with, with good security solutions. Uh, so the, we have launched the, the, the solution a month ago. It is quite successful. 
Uh, and now we are trying to onboard as fast as we can all our uh, new enterprise customers. Uh, and the, the, and our uh, objective, our ambition is really to secure uh, billions and billions of uh, of assets using our, uh, our our technology for these uh, institutions. Earlier, we talked about so the en enterprise blind optimism that we had there, right? Uh, in in terms of in terms of adoption. Uh, but as a company, it seems that now uh, Ledger is is building products for hedge funds, uh, asset management firms, uh, limited partnerships, etc. Talk about perhaps like uh, what what are the particular uh, traits of of these types of customers as opposed to sort of the enterprise, um, and also give us a sense of the need there. So like. How, how how what's the scale of the uh, of the need uh, sort of the the customer base here that you have potentially uh, for this product? So all our customers are believers in cryptocurrency. So it's really about cryptocurrency. It's not about uh, blockchain or uh, uh, some kind of uh, private blockchain uh, DLTs. Or it's really about cryptocurrency. Uh, so that's why it makes a lot of sense. And uh, there is like real use cases um, because financial institutions uh, really want to move forward into crypto uh, because it's an asset. Uh, which is now, which has now a lot of legitimacy. I think everyone uh, is convinced that these assets are here to stay, and there is no way that this asset manager, hedge fund manager, financial institutions are not going to take uh, a share of the pie uh, because uh, they are here to make profits, uh, and so they want to play to play the game of crypto. But the only way to do it is if they have the proper infrastructure to manage that. Because if you want to buy stocks, bonds, or everything. You always have the custodians, you always have third-party banks who are going to keep these assets for you secure. So it's you don't think about how you are going to secure them. Um, and if you buy gold, physical gold, you are going to find depository where you can put the gold in vault and everything is insured, etc. In crypto, all that doesn't exist. So the biggest problem that all these institutions have is how can they hold and secure the cryptos? And the ledger vault is an answer uh, to that. Uh, so we are talking about the scale of hundreds of customers. Uh, it's not yet in the thousands, but it's in the hundreds of potential, let's say, hedge funds and family offices who wants to go into crypto. I guess maybe in one, two years, it can move to the, to the thousands because now this is the early adopters that we are seeing uh, moving forward to crypto. And we have seen more than one hedge fund or investment bank who wants individually to put at least one or two billion dollars into crypto. Uh, so all combined, uh, we can see an influx of tens of billions easily uh, in crypto. So um, I'm pretty convinced that next year uh, we are going to see these uh, massive investments, especially now that the price is low. It's a better opportunity for these financial institutions to enter because they are not entering at the highest of the market, which wouldn't be good for them. I thought initially that we will see all this um, uh, financial institution investment uh, this year, uh, but I saw that you know it's, everything is taking always more time that you that you think, especially to just the time to deploy the vault solutions and others. Uh, but for sure, in 2000, the, the first semester of 2019 is going to be interesting because uh, we are going to see a lot of movements from the financial indus industry into into cryptocurrencies. And, and what was the choice? So the Ledger Vault, it's actually the first time I hear of a product, uh, you know, that's like hardware based, kind of, you know, non-custodial large key management system, you know, asset management system. Of course, there are, you know, other companies that are also trying to offer kind of custodial solutions for, or, or they're trying to offer more custodial solutions for, um, you know, for some of these funds and where they actually you know, manage the key. So what do you think are some of the, you know, pros and cons of the ledger approach versus um, a sort of more purely custodial approach? So um, 
you have Xapo, for instance, who is a Bitcoin custodian, uh, who has shown the, its quality into securing uh, assets. Uh, you have BitGo, who is also providing uh, with some kind of custodian solution. Uh, uh, you also have Coinbase, uh, which is a full custodian, uh, but the, the solution is not ready yet. And I would say that the the drawbacks, if I can call them like that, is that it's very limited in the number of crypto. Uh, for instance, BitGo can only manage uh, cryptocurrencies which have built-in multi-signature, uh, like Bitcoin, like uh, Litecoin, and a few others, uh, but they, they cannot uh, manage all the other crypto. Xapo is doing only Bitcoin, and Coinbase is also limited to the number of crypto they can add because they are heavily regulated. And so, the, the vault is really a very flexible and powerful solution for self-custody, which is not exactly the same than full custodian because basically with the vault, the customer stay, still stay the, the owner of the funds. For full custodian, because some regulated hedge funds require to have, uh, to have a full custodian, uh, a qualified custodian, they cannot self-custody. Then we have uh, announced a partnership with Nomura, uh, which is um, one of the biggest banks in Japan, who is going to use our technology and provide a full custodian solution for all crypto. Um, so the idea is to be able to provide, to have a go-to-market, either for, let's say, a smaller hedge fund or hedge fund who do not require uh, this full custodian solution, so they can self-custody and use our uh, solution cannot can work also for um, family offices or foundations or ICOs. You know, have uh, like hundreds of millions and they need the governance. And for uh, hedge funds who need qualified custodians, the idea will be to work with uh, this consortium called Comenu, on which we are working with uh, Nomura and other banks. Uh, hopefully, who are going to join to be able to provide with uh, the best-in-class solution for the market. So we, we talked a bit about security, but I'd like to focus on this uh, as, as, as we uh, come to the close of our episode here. So Ledger is probably, I guess, would be safe to say, uh, being attacked constantly. I mean, you also sort of promote that uh, through bug bounties and, and contests and this sort of thing. But um, you're sitting in a very particular place where people are trying to hack your product all the time, and there are billions of dollars uh, worth of assets sitting on Ledger uh, devices all, all around the world. Um, talk about what that means, sort of personally, as, as a CEO and as a public person in this space, uh, but also as a company, sort of how do you uh, build that, that, uh, that culture of security within the company? First of all, we are selling safes, okay? And safes are decentralized by nature. So there is no central point of failure at Ledger where someone could hack and run away with billions of assets uh, because no such things exist. So it's not like we are an exchange uh, with billions and we can get hacked. Uh, so people are always trying to, to hack and our devices, like. It's like akin to trying to, to, to open a safe, you know, to find a way, a clever way to, to, to open a safe. Um, but uh, usually, uh, if you can maybe try to hack one, it will not open them all. Uh, and uh, so that's why there is not a central risk for our customers. Uh, what is central is the firmware update, uh, because uh, you could think, okay, uh, Ledger could... Uh, get hacked and could release a firmware update that would, uh, let's say, exfiltrate the private keys using uh, side channels or something like that. So we do have very strong security mechanisms to provide with the signature of our firmware updates because only a firmware update which has been signed, let's say, by the certificate of Ledger can be accepted by the devices. Um, and so we are using the same level of governance that is used in the vault which means that you require multi-signature uh, from different persons. And so even if as a CEO I was kidnapped or held ransom and everything, uh, it will activate some fail-safe that will prevent anyway uh, the signature uh, to be done. Uh, and uh, regarding security in itself, uh, of course, we take it very seriously. 
we have a security lab where we have hired um, eight uh, now security specialists who are working all the time into trying to hack our uh, devices, firmware, technology, website, etc. We also have a contest with bounties where uh, we, uh, we, um, we pay all the security researchers who can find some uh, vulnerabilities. Um, security is always a game of cat and mouse. There is no such thing as ultimate uh, bulletproof security. It's just always a question of how you can build the best product possible. And there is always iteration. We have, see, we have had some, uh, let's say, firmware vulnerabilities uh, that was more or less easy to, uh, to activate, often quite difficult to, to, to activate. Uh, but uh, that's why there is this possibility to update the firmware. Uh, and our objective is always to stay ahead of the game. And that's the, the work of Ledger. That's why that's our main assets. And that's why we have, let's say, uh, the best specialists in the world that you can find into embedded security, secure chips that are working constantly to, to, to have the best possible security. And it's always important to stay humble uh, and to make sure that people uh, can uh, and, and try to open the solution as much as possible so people can really act on it. Uh, and we come from an industry where there is a lot, especially in the secure chip, when there is a lot of, uh, let's say, security by obscurity. And what we are trying, what we are doing at Ledger with all our, uh, by pu publishing some, uh, all this context and these hardware bounties and everything is going, uh, is quite new into this environment. And we are hoping that it's going to, uh, to help us go to the highest level of security uh, ever seen. And the next stage is to create all the certifications, all the standards, uh, because it's important for our uh, customers to know that all the security targets that we have has been audited by a third party. It's not just only the good world of Ledger. Uh, and so to be able to do that, first you need to write the standards. And this is what we are doing at Ledger to, to be able to have the same kind of standardization certifications that you can find in the legacy payment industry. And can you talk about uh, perhaps uh, in your view, what makes Ledger more secure than other uh, hardware solutions out there? Like, why should someone choose a ledger for its security aspects over something else that they can find on the market? Uh, there are two kinds of microprocessors because a hardware wallet, this is a, this is a computer, you know, it's, it's a secure computer, and the objective of this computer is to make sure that the private key, the assets which are inside, cannot get extracted. And to build this computer, uh, you have two choices. Either you use a regular microprocessor, and the, the same kind that you will find in, uh, in remote control, microwave, kettle, you know, toys, or you use a secure microprocessor, which you can find in chip in credit cards, SIM cards, uh, passports, all critical you know, uh, applications. Uh, and the advantage of the secure chips is that uh, you cannot open them easily. Uh, because if you take a regular microprocessor, you just take it from the table, you can open it, you can extract very easily uh, the secrets because it has not been designed with security in mind. Ledger is the only company in the world using secure chips uh, because our core technology is an operating system designed for the secure chips. And access to secure chip is quite complex uh, because it requires to show uh, some kind of credentials to be able to access to the uh, underlying, uh, let's say, structure of the chip, which you need to know to build this operating system, etc. And so it's a high, very high barrier to, to entry. So uh, you can, if you compare, for instance, Trezor to Ledger, this is the main difference. Um, of course, uh, there are other things to take into account because like the UX, the form factor and, and everything, and for the end user, a secure chip, not secure chips, they don't understand really the, the difference. But one thing is for sure is that Trezor, for instance, will never be able to go on the enterprise market because it's impossible to give any level of certification uh, for not secure chip. And my prediction also is 
in a few years or when we are going to see you know, much more mainstream adoption of cryptos, that it will work a lot and a lot of people will have hardware wallets, uh, you will see some tools that will be able to extract very easily uh, the private keys from uh, Trezor, for instance, because you can glitch the chip, you can bug it, and then in, to make it extract uh, the, 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 the private key, you are going to see a lot of counterfeit uh, Trezors. Uh, it will be very interesting for makers of fake Trezors just to sell them on Amazon, and, and, and because there is no way to protect against forgery. Trezor right now is using uh, these stickers, you know, holographic stickers, but that's just what we call security theater because you can, it's very easy to duplicate them. Uh, so in the end, if right now I would say people do not understand really why a secure chip is better than not a secure chip, uh, my prediction is that in a few years, building security products on unsecure technology is going to, to create a big, big problem. Uh, and so in the long term, that's why uh, Ledger Prevent has a solution that can really scale uh, and, uh, and, uh, and provide with really securities that can get certified and audited by third party. This is a surprise to me. I, I, I was under the assumption that other hardware wallet solutions were also using secure chips. And I think, I think most people that buy these solutions also assume so. Yeah, because uh, I guess uh, people and, and uh, people do not understand the difference, and it's and, uh, that's fine, you know, because try to explain what is a secure chip is very hard. But Trezor is, and KeepKey are not using secure chips. Uh, it's uh, there are no there are no solution right now in the market with uh, real secure chips because it's it's hard. You know, hardware is hard. Secure hardware is even harder. Uh, and uh, and so it, Trezor is not using secure chip because it's not a choice by design. It's just that they cannot access secure chip anyway uh, because it's like you want to uh, to print uh, notes, you know, bank notes, uh, and so you call the central bank and you ask for you know the printer, the inks. No one is going to give you this information. Uh, so it's the same to, to get access to secure chips because it's a very protected industry, uh, and uh, Ledger is part of in this is part of this industry, um, and we are trying also to change this industry, which is working a lot on uh, security by obscurity, uh, to, 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 to evolve the model through to a more open source approach, which is very new into the secure industry. And what Ledger is doing there is also, uh, uh, let's say, creating some, some ripples uh, and not always well understood. <laughs> uh, but we are trying to, 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 to move also the secure chip industry into to open source. And then we will have both of uh, best world. What, what is it that makes Ledger different in terms of their access to this, this industry? The, the, the access to chip makers, I presume, is what you're saying. Yes, because in order to build the secure your operating system, you need to have access to the, let's say, to the blueprint of the secure chip. And this is highly classified uh, information because uh, basically all the financial industry, uh, uh, government identities, everything is built on these chips. Um, so the only way to get access is to convince the chip manufacturers and others that uh, you understand what you are doing, that you are not going to provide with bugged code, which is going to create some, reveal some underlying of the, of the chip infrastructure. And basically, um, why Ledger managed to do that is thanks to Nicola Baca, our CTO, and his team, who was coming from this industry. Uh, BT Chip, which is the, the company uh, with whom Ledger has merged, had a decade of experience in, in, of working with uh, secure chips. So people coming from the big company like Oberture or Gemalto, uh, bringing all this know-how. And this is what makes the, the, the technology of Ledger uh, unique. And that's why it's very hard to duplicate uh, what we have done so far. So I just wanted to understand maybe one last question on this. I wanted to understand so exactly the difference between secure chip not uh, and let's say something that's in Trezor. So does that mean like let's say you had physical access to the Trezor, you would have 
some way of potentially extracting key material or, and and with a secure chip like with ledger you have uh, this authentication that every action there's a key check or, or can you explain cuz i didn't fully understand the the difference yes of course um there are like different advantages security advantage of the secure chip um if you have physical access uh, then uh, secure chips has a few, uh, let's say, technology to prevent uh, the, the, the extraction of, the, uh, of its uh, secure information. First of all, for instance, all the memory uh, is encrypt encrypted all the time. The location of the memory cell is a secret. I mean, even if you use a laser and you tr try to decay uh, open the chip, you will not be able to, it will be extremely difficult to... Uh, let's say, uh, rebuild the secret inside. There is a lot of countermeasures uh, regarding, uh, let's say, uh, differential power attack or side channel. It means, for instance, that uh, let's say that uh, you want to enter a pin code, okay? You enter the pin code and then uh, you verify that if it's, it's, it's okay or not. And if it's not okay, you are going to decrement the number of, of tries. So you can have only three times, okay? If you are using an um, unsecured chip, you can what we call glitch it. You can just cut the power, and then it's not going to write down that you, you did this try, you know? Uh, this is a very basic example. With a secure chip, if you try to modify the clock, if you try to glitch the chip, it's not going to work. It's not going you know, to, uh, to be any help. There will be also some countermeasures to make sure that there is no or the less possible of a side channel attack. Because, for instance, when you do a cryptographic operation, it's going to emit some frequencies or some noise. And if you read that with an oscilloscope, you will be able to infer some data about what you do. On a non secure chip, there is no such countermeasures. Also, if you take the chip, you glitch it, and you put it in debug mode you will be able to dump all the memory. Uh, there is no debug mode. It's not possible to debug a secure chip. Um, so basically, uh, it's, it's like uh, a safe uh, that was built by uh, a five years old, you know, just in, uh, in cardboard, and a safe which is built uh, with a real uh, reinforced steel. Uh, there is big difference between the two. Uh, so you can use an unsecured chip to, to make it. It's going to work, and uh, you can uh, you can do many things with it. But when it's come to security, if you have physical access, it is very easy just to uh, extract uh, the information. Uh, so as long as you have your chip with you, or if you put a passphrase, which means that you need to enter a passphrase on the chip each time that you are going to use, then you are safe. Uh, but the advantage of Ledger is you can have highest level of security, and you do not have to enter a passphrase each time that you use, uh, the, each time that you use the, uh, the device. So these uh, security features uh, are very essential. And uh, with our attack laboratory, we are going to demonstrate uh, some, let's say, use cases or explain the differences. So our customers or people who are curious about that uh, can better understand. We will have some some video uh, where basically we have uh, we have attack labs with lasers. And you just send you send a laser beam on the on the chip at some point, and it's going to give you all the all the secrets that that it contains. So we are going to show some practical example of the differences between secure and unsecured chip because it's true that it's not an easy thing to understand. Uh, and it's not an easy thing to market as well because people don't want to, uh, to, to, to have to understand that. That's why ultimately the real difference will be in certification because with secure chip, you can ensure certification and that is something that consumer can, can really understand. Some kind of stamp of approval from third party audit company uh, who, have, who can uh, show that everything that you say is secure is uh, really secure. 
Cool. Well, thanks so much, Eric, for elaborating on this. I wasn't really aware of this, and that that was very, very interesting to hear about that. And and in general, thanks so much for coming on. I think it was super interesting to hear about Ledger's growth, about the product, and and about this uh, security technology as well. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And of course, thanks so much for a listener for once again tuning in. So we're going to have, of course, in the in the show notes, we're going to have some links to Ledger website, to also some of the blog posts about the new, the new desktop wallet that's coming out soon. And uh, of course, you can subscribe to our podcast. You can subscribe to it via any podcast application you use. You can listen to it on SoundCloud or you can watch the video on youtube.com slash epicenter Bitcoin. And yeah, so if you want to support the show, you can also leave an iTunes review for us. That helps new people find the show and we appreciate that very much. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.